This week, we'll be looking at how the IPA represents vowels beyond those just in general North American English, as well as intonation and tone. We'll also be looking at the computer program PROT, which we'll be using to do acoustic analysis of speech. This is the full set of base symbols for vowels in the IPA. A subset of these, called the cardinal vowels, are defined with respect to certain extreme articulations. The highest, the frontest, the lowest, the backest, the most round, and the most spread possible while still having a vowel. Note that these are idealized extremes and are not actually normally used in spoken language. For example, the cardinal vowel E is the highest, frontest, and most spread possible vowel you can make, but most languages don't have a high front vowel that is quite that extreme, instead having a vowel that's more like E, as in general North American English. But by convention in the IPA, we often use a symbol that is not exactly accurate in order to use something that is typographically simpler, easy to read, easy to type, and easy to understand. The cardinal vowel E is close enough to general North American English E that it's okay to use that symbol. The first eight cardinal vowels that we're going to define are called the primary cardinal vowels. These are vowels that obey certain articulatory and acoustic tendencies that languages frequently make use of. One of those tendencies is that front vowels tend to have spread lips and back vowels tend to have round lips. This is because the second formant of a vowel, its F2, is dependent on both its frontness or backness and its lip spreading or lip rounding. As we know from our discussion of the acoustic properties of vowels, F2 increases from back to front, so that front vowels have a high F2 and back vowels have a low F2. Similarly, the configuration of the lips also has an effect on F2. When the lips are spread, this causes the overall vocal tract length to shorten, which causes all formants to raise. This is particularly prominent on F2. Conversely, when the lips are rounded, this elongates the overall vocal tract length, which causes all the formants to lower, again, especially F2. When we combine these two types of articulation, frontness versus backness, and lip spreading versus lip rounding, in the right way, so that we get a high F2 for both, or a low F2 for both, we get what we call acoustic enhancement, of the type that we've also seen for general North American English, s, which tends to be pronounced with spread lips to enhance its already high frequencies, and sh, which tends to be pronounced with rounded lips, enhancing its already low frequencies. The other tendency that the primary cardinal vowels demonstrate is that as the jaw opens to make lower and lower vowels, it becomes harder and harder to round the lips, so that ultimately low vowels tend not to have rounded lips at all. The result is that for the eight primary cardinal vowels, the front vowels and the low vowels are defined with spread lips, and the non-low back vowels are defined with rounded lips. These eight primary cardinal vowels are conventionally numbered 1 to 8, beginning with E and going counterclockwise around the vowel space. E, 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 A, A, O, O, U. The next eight cardinal vowels are called the secondary cardinal vowels. These are just like the primary cardinal vowels, highest, frontest, backest, lowest, most spread, and most round articulations possible, but they have the lip configuration reversed from the primary cardinal vowels. That is, all of the front and low secondary cardinal vowels have rounded lips instead of spread lips, and the non-low back secondary cardinal vowels have spread lips instead of rounded lips. The secondary cardinal vowels are conventionally numbered 9 through 16, again beginning with the high front vowel and moving counterclockwise around the vowel space. E, 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 A, O, A, 
uh, uh. The remaining vowels in the IPA chart are defined by their relationship to these 16 cardinal vowels. For example, the high central uh and u, uh, the barred i and barred u, are the highest possible articulation and exactly centered between the frontest and backest possible articulations. While having maximally spread lips for barred i and maximally rounded lips for barred u. A few of the vowels in the chart warrant special discussion because their official IPA definitions do not match how we were using them for general North American English. First, the IPA uses the letter A to represent cardinal vowel number four, the low front spread vowel A. Ah. But we've been using that symbol to represent the beginning of the diphthongs in general North American English I and ow. The beginning of these two diphthongs is actually more central and would require a more complex notation if we wanted to be exactly accurate. Fortunately, the IPA recommends using the most typographically simplest notation available when we don't need to have precise phonetic details encoded. The next symbol where our notation for general North American English deviates significantly from the IPA's cardinal vowels is for cardinal vowel number 14, represented by the symbol wedge. This cardinal vowel is a lower mid back unrounded vowel. Ah. Uh. But for general North American English, we've been using it to represent something in the mid central range. In fact, this vowel is sometimes pronounced somewhat lower, anywhere from mid to near low. Historically, and even in some modern dialects of English, this vowel was much farther back, and the tradition of using the wedge symbol to represent it has persisted. The third and final symbol that we'll discuss that differs somewhat from how we used it for general North American English versus its official IPA definition is the symbol ash. In the IPA, this symbol represents a near low vowel, halfway between cardinal vowels 3 and 4. For general North American English, we use this to represent what we called a low vowel, but in fact that vowel ranges in pronunciation from low up to mid, depending on the speaker, their dialect, and the position in which the vowel is pronounced. In addition to the base symbols, the IPA also has a number of diacritics, which are little marks that can be used on a base symbol to indicate slight variations in its pronunciation. The first six diacritics that we'll discuss come in three pairs, representing fronting and backing, raising and lowering, and lip spreading and lip rounding. For example, for cardinal vowel number eight, oo, we can put the plus symbol underneath it as a diacritic to indicate that it is slightly fronter, oo. This diacritic can then be used for any vowel that isn't already maximally front to indicate that it has a slightly fronter articulation than its official IPA definition. For vowels that are already maximally front, this diacritic would make no sense because such an articulation would be impossible. Similarly, the minus sign can be used under a base symbol to indicate that it has a backer articulation than its official IPA definition. And again, this symbol cannot combine with base symbols where it would make no sense, where you would get a physically impossible articulation, vowels that are already maximally back. The two small t diacritics are used under a base symbol to indicate that the vowel is pronounced higher or lower than its official IPA definition. And as always, these diacritics cannot be used with a base symbol that would result in a physically impossible articulation. The third pair of diacritics deal with lip configuration. These diacritics can be used on a base symbol to show that what would normally be a truly round vowel actually has less rounding and is closer to spread, or vice versa. The IPA also has two special diacritics that can be used to represent frontness and backness or height differences, but in a different way. Two dots over a base symbol, called a diaresis or umlaut, can be used to represent centralization of the articulation 
That is, for front vowels, they are articulated somewhat backer, and for back vowels, they are articulated somewhat fronter. This can be used to represent a truly central vowel when the IPA does not provide a relevant base symbol. A diacritic with a similar function is a small x used over a base symbol to indicate mid-centralization. That is, both centralization and a tongue position that is more mid. So using this diacritic on a base symbol from the upper left of the chart would indicate a pronunciation that is backer and lower, while using it on a base symbol from the lower left would indicate a pronunciation that is higher and backer and similarly for the other base symbols in the chart. Note that the eight diacritics discussed so far do not have absolute strict definitions, but instead are relative articulations. For example, the retraction and centralization diacritics both represent some amount of backing for a front vowel like E, but the exact amount is not defined. They could both refer to the same position, or one could be in front of the other. The IPA also has two diacritics to represent advanced and retracted tongue root, that is, moving the tongue root away from the pharyngeal wall or towards it, which is often used to represent tense and lax vowels where the IPA has no appropriate base symbol. The IPA includes a special diacritic to indicate a pronunciation somewhat like the general North American English R, the rhotic, this diacritic indicates rhoticization, or roticity, or R-coloring, which means some combination of lip rounding, pharyngealization, and curling of the tongue tip. This diacritic is most frequently seen used on schwa, and this is so frequent, in fact, the IPA has a special modified version of schwa that goes along with the roticity mark. Like nasal stops, vowels can also have a lowered velum, allowing air to flow through the nasal cavity, creating a nasalized vowel. This is represented in the IPA by a tilde diacritic over the vowel's base symbol. We've seen this diacritic before for the nasalized vowels in English that occur before nasal stops, as in pan. Vowels may also be voiceless, so that the vocal folds are not vibrating. This is represented in the IPA with a small circle diacritic that goes under the vowel's base symbol. We've previously seen this diacritic on consonants, as in the general North American English pronunciation of the word play, where the L is voiceless. The IPA also has a set of three diacritics that can indicate differences in vowel length. For languages in which differences in vowel length are linguistically significant, we normally only need to represent short versus long vowels, with short vowels being left unmarked and long vowels having a pointy colon after them. However, if a third or fourth level of distinction in vowel length is needed, we can represent an extra short vowel with a brev diacritic over the base symbol, and we can represent a vowel length between short and long, half long, with the top half of the pointy colon. Finally, when representing diphthongs, it is often useful to know which part of the diphthong is the most prominent, the loudest, what we call syllabic. By default, vowels are assumed to be syllabic, so the IPA provides a diacritic, an inverted brev that goes under the base symbol, to represent a non-syllabic vowel. For example, in a diphthong made up of a sequence of e and u, we could get two different results depending on which part is syllabic and which part is non-syllabic. If the E portion of this diphthong is non-syllabic, we get the diphthong U, which is an on-gliding or rising diphthong. If instead the U portion of this diphthong is non-syllabic, then we get the diphthong U, which is an off-gliding or falling diphthong.